17, and he didn't get to how old was he? He eight? was 17 when he started high school. And he graduated at 21. Would that be right? He went back. He went back to school at 21. We're trying to make a college. video of talking about the name. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. This is real life. You, you know, you're being recorded. <laughs> no, I didn't put it. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Right. So I you were going to edit it anyway. <laughs> so much. Oh, leave it in there. Um, <laughs> so wrong. you all. I mean, do you all feel that way, too, that partly he was interested in seeing these kids who didn't have an opportunity for secondary education was partly from his own experience or no? Well, well, definitely. Absolutely. Yes. But he, Ruth, you mentioned the, the country people. I don't know that that was as much of a bearing as it was the church kids that he he saw, as, and a lot of them were country people, but it was our own church kids that... that uh, didn't have the opportunity to go to a secondary school that his, I thought was his, probably his primary target, but he made no distinction between them and anybody else that wanted to come. Um, there was, there was, there was no, no restrictions on having to belong to the church or be part of the church. I think he encouraged any of the church people to come that would, but that was his, original primary focus was our own church kids and then anybody else that that was there and wanted to come well if they wanted to come they had a built-in bus driver here oh <laughs> <laughs> what was the name, name of your bus, bus? nathan go pick them up in the bus <laughs> <laughs> i'll pull up the name in a minute he knows he won't say it <laughs> i can't think comfort? of it comfort no comfort. that wasn't no, comfort. Wasn't no comfort. that was selwyn's bus it was uh Oops, what was the name of that old bus? I don't know. Uh, I'll think I wasn't sure it. our bus had a name. <coughs> oh, yeah. It had a name. Nathan's bus. <laughs> we'll go with that. Yeah, it had a name. <laughs> so tell, me, tell us about um, when you um, landed in Grenada. What happened? What, what was that like? Um, me and Pi don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you, oh. Kent, you were two, and Quentin, you were five. Five. First of all, What's we had. What's your first memory of Grenada then? <laughs> Probably getting beat for not going to school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was me. <laughs> or church. <laughs> my Sleeping first, in church. My first memory was a welcome service, and I, I can't honestly tell you whether it was the first time or the second time because we came back after being there five years. But I always liked to sing, and the uh, mom would put me up to sing. And they put me up to sing in front of all these people. And I didn't know. And I'm a, this probably was the second time because it was a welcome service. I don't know if they had a welcome service the first time or yes. not. But, yeah. but it was a welcome you, service. You sang at the welcome service. And they put time. me up in front of all these people. And I, I remember just inhaling and inhaling and inhaling. And I couldn't get my breath. <laughs> I couldn't get the song started. And finally... And I forgot the name of the song. It'll come to me in a minute, too. But that's my first memory is having to sing at the welcome service. Nate, a little bitty kid. No, I didn't sing at the welcome service. <laughs> <laughs> the he one sang, memory Nate and I don't sang. have is we never sang. Oh, no, Nate, Nate sang. Oh, yeah. oh, did he? Nate sang at, yeah. uh, at uh, speech night. Joshua mm -hmm. was the son of man. No, no. <laughs> well, he sang that Nate? one, too. Well, he may have sang twice then, but. <laughs> It'll come to me the one he sang at speech night. He had to have a little backbone for that one, though. I think he'll tell you if he tells the truth. <laughs> my first, my first memory of when we landed that night after welcome service, we stayed at the house there at at the on the school grounds, and we just had some fiber mattresses, as I recall, on the floor. Um, maybe there was a bed or two that. Mom and Dad would have used, and maybe the Ruth says one bed, but we, of course, no electricity, and I'm not sure if we had any regular uh, lanterns or just lamp lamps, but um, somewhere in the night we found a congaree, <laughs> and we had no idea what congarees were, except that this worm-like animal was crawling around on the floor and mom went 
into orbit, <laughs> thinking that here these children were going to be bitten by this animal, and who knows whether they would survive or not. <laughs> and come to find out, it was just a congaree. <laughs> What I remember was our plane was late getting there. The people were all gathered in the upstairs of the school building. And here we come as a family. It's semi-dark because they've got hanging lamps. But we walk in and you can't see anybody. You can't tell anybody from anybody else. And it's like... What, what are we, where are we? <laughs> and, but they had lovely, lovely flowers and had it fixed up very nice and lots of speeches and welcomes. As soon as the church service was over, it was late. We'd been traveling. They took us over to the house and like they said, just mats on the floor kind of and except mom and dad had a bed. And... Again, you couldn't tell much, but the little lizards were plenteous. We woke up the next morning, and it was beautiful light. And I can remember going back to the back door by the bathroom and looking out, and the beautiful, beautiful light, and it was it was amazing. The missionaries had put to our our boxes had not gotten there from the states. The missionaries put together, so each one of us kids had one piece of silverware <coughs> and one saucer or plate of some sort. There was a little kerosene stove in the kitchen, no refrigerator. Um, anyway, pretty primitive. Uh, not that we were had tons of stuff in the States, but it was a lot different than that. Uh, we would have been considered quite poor people in the States compared to most, but we did have food, we had what we needed, and um, a hard-working mother and daddy that... Ruth, you and I have talked about it offline before, about dad's salary, how much money he made, um, and being... Um, considered well off down there. I don't know if it's because we were white people or because we were from America or, or what, but um, you and I have talked about salary that dad took and what kind of support the church offered him and, and all of that. The church, from what mother told me, was the church offered them, told them that they would give them missionary salary the first year they were there. After that, they were on their own that the church would not be financially supporting them. They would need to make their own living through the school if they were going to um, stay. I don't think they really thought that mother and daddy would be staying, that they could didn't think they could make it. Mother said, Daddy, after the first year, Daddy did go back to the school, church board, missionary board, and ask them for six months more of support and then after that they lived on the same wages that the teachers in Grenada lived on if whatever daddy's position at the school was he got paid from the government the same amount that anybody any Grenadian would get for the same position and mother did not take any salary, although she was a full-time teacher, at least for probably the first three years. And then she told Daddy she just had to have a little more income. So um, they, they were truly living Grenadian lifestyle. We all learned how to be frugal. How to be frugal. And we had each other. We never considered ourselves poor, I don't believe. But um. so we found an interesting story in um, one of Grandpa's letters. He was trying. To, we found many letters where he was recruiting teachers from um, among his friends from far and near, 
and um, he was trying to recruit one teacher, and she said that she didn't feel like she was going to be able to raise the funds to go, and Grandpa said, well, whatever we get, we'll just split it with you. <laughs> and um, if they starve, they'd all just starve together. <laughs> and um, anyway, I think that she ended up coming. Was that Miss? I think it was Miss Brown. Miss Brown, maybe that um, they had that conversation in one of the letters that um, Grandpa said, "Well, you just go ahead and come, and if you don't get anything, we'll just split what we've got. And if we starve, we'll all starve together." I know one month, Miss Brown and Miss Gill were there, and um, some way something had gotten mixed up, and their their pay didn't come through. And so they had packets of soup mix. So every day they would go home from school and, and one would say to the other, what would you like for supper? And the other one would say, oh, I'd like soup. <laughs> They'd say, well, that's what we'll have is soup. And basically they lived on that those soup packets for a month. Nobody would have known that until after the fact probably because there was no complaining. Our dad did a very good job of managing to uh, get soup, something besides soup for us. And we mother had help to cook Grenadian food uh, for us and while she taught. And so we ate, I would say, quite well. So, go ahead, Alex. Bakes for breakfast. Bakes for breakfast. <laughs> Breadfruit. Uh-huh. And dashing and callaloo. It was a new experience for Kansas kids, right? <laughs> yeah. So, tell us um, about the day you went exploring and wound up down in Guav when you first got to Grenada and Freddie came. Well, I don't know if I remember all that story, but it would have been like the second day or whatever we, after we got there, we'll... We just went exploring, and and I guess I was by myself, and I followed the river all the way to Guau. How old were you? I was nine. And You've never been to Grenada before. And then I got out on the, the road at Guau, and, and I didn't know how to get back home, but everybody wanted to know where I was from, and I'd say I was from Kansas. <laughs> and they didn't know where that was either, so. But because I was a white boy, I think they... They directed me up the road, and and I don't know where Freddie came in, but somewhere probably at Waterloo. Well, somebody got me and knew where I belong. Yeah. Uh, St. Paul at Waterloo. Yeah. Matthew, what's that one? Lionel. Uh, Lionel. His wife told me that story. <coughs> I didn't know that story about Albert, but his wife remembered. Who was that? Lionel, Lionel St. Paul. Paul's wife. That she ran the little store at Waterloo. Uh -huh. And when we went back down, she wanted to talk to me and yeah. she told me about Albert uh, walking down but since we were the only white people around they pretty much knew where he had come from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that introduces Freddie. Um, Freddie has ended up being a big part of all of our lives even when I went down there in the early 1990s Freddie was still around and picked me up at the airport helped me with my luggage and then um, brought me rock bananas every day and um, you know, looked big, out for rock me. Big. Rock big, yeah. Um, so, who else? Freddie's still um, there doing that. If you go there now, Freddie will well, do the I, same thing. Well, I want to go back and see Freddie. He'll do that's the same thing. That's important to me. So we I didn't know him as Freddie. We knew him as D. Yeah. D. yeah, yeah. But the funny thing with them, they had seven kids in their family. We had seven kids. Freddie and Mailing, right? One boy, or one girl and six boys. Their family, too? Their family, too. And Ernest and I was talking about this the other day. Of the um, 14 kids, all 14 of us are still alive. Wow. Pretty amazing. Freddie so. and his wife, Maylene, were just like um, second parents, really, to all of us. And Mother could trust us to them at any time. They... Freddie and Maylene were not married when we went, but they later got married, and Maylene wore the dress I had for eighth grade graduation here at in Kansas, my prize dress, and that became her wedding dress. <laughs> Quentin, um, you kind of adopted Maylene as your second mom for sure, didn't you? Sure, yeah. Um, ate many meals. And 
We all did. We all did. All did. Her kids. One thing about Maylene, she would cook for you. What, did, what was her best dishes? Oh, money cool. <laughs> <laughs> Those kids, her kids would eat at our house if it was meal time, and, and they were up there, or we would eat at their house. She would share a plate for us just like any of her other children. We we never thought thought anything but never was, knocked to go to their house, just walked in as one if of the it family. Was, if it was meal time and we were there, then you got a plate. And if it was, they were at our house and it was meal time, got they got a chair at the table just like anyone else. And uh, we we fought, we loved, we <laughs> whatever brothers and sisters and friends did. It was it was like family. I want to put in a word for somebody else that lived in that community. Yeah, I want I want some that, of those stories. You know, Maylene was was like a second mother, of course, and Freddie is still my hero. If Freddie dies, I intend to make it to Grenada for his funeral. I made it for Maylene's funeral. This other lady, I would have ma made it. I just didn't have enough contact to know when she passed away. But her name was Miss Kaisi. Yeah. That's Marco's mother. And rightly so, the mom and dad went as missionaries for the church. And so the church people probably became a little closer. And they probably had a little more contact with the family and maybe more to gain. I don't know. But Miss Kaisi was was twice as poor as anybody in that community. And I don't know about the other boys, but I never went there at mealtime, but what she dished out a plate for me, right along with her children. Miss Kaisi didn't have enough money to feed her own children. I One of the worst scoldings I ever got, I had bought a pig and I had it on a rope and that's the way we raised pigs there. And that pig had got strangled. And so by the time I found it, it was several hours later, I buried it. When Miss Casey found out, I got one of the worst scoldings I'd ever got. She said, I could have fed my family with that pig and you buried it. She would have eaten that, that pig that had been strangled because they were poor. Yeah. But in that poor, she was... One of the most generous people I knew. Still touches my heart because she gave what she didn't have. Pai's buddy, that he talks about Numpe, that's her son. Yes, Numpe, Numpe, how you belly big so? Patata. <laughs> pot water. You know what pot water was? It was the water you poured off when you boiled green bananas. Just like when you boil potatoes and you pour the water down the sink. That's pot water. Wow. That's why Numpe's belly was big so because he drank so much pot water. Because they didn't ha they they needed every nutrient they could get their hands on. I say, bio, bio. <laughs> big male rat. <laughs> hold it, hold it, we're gonna stew it. <laughs> so tell me But in that poverty, the generosity, she didn't give because she had it to give. She gave from the generosity of her heart. I admire that. She, as far as I know, never darkened the door of our church. Most generous woman, I suppose, I ever knew. She always smoked a pipe. I don't know where she got the money for her tobacco. <laughs> but what I'm saying is just the kindness of her heart. It wasn't her religion. It wasn't because it was expected. Probably the most generous example that I've been shown. I love her. Can't tell us about the hummingbird and the wing. <laughs> we, we were young and stupid and tried to figure out how many different birds we could eat. So any bird we caught, we would cook it up in a little brown sugar and cook it. So we caught a hummingbird in the screen at the school one day. Well, that became our Little meal. <laughs> Emphasis on middle. Yeah. So Malene cooked it up for you. Huh? No, no, we cooked. We you cooked, cooked it. it. Oh yeah, <laughs> the brown sugar and water and pull the feathers and fried it. 
But we we cooked it. We ate every bird I think except a cowbird. <laughs> <laughs> what but, about um, Sheila? Does she like live at the house? Maybe? When we first got to Grenada, somebody had arranged for Sheila to come and help our mother at, in the home. And of course, Kent was just you know two years old, and. Uh, needed care and and uh, somebody needed to cook and and do what needed to be done so mother could be gone all day as well as the fact that the building was just a big cocoa bacon it it was just an empty hollow huge dirty building and we this was in November that we got there and we were daddy wanted to start school in January and us kids weren't going to be helpful at the house because Daddy had things for us to do. But so Sheila was going to help my mom. Laundry all had to be done by hand. So for seven children, that was quite a bit of laundry, even if you didn't wear change clothes too often. It was still a lot of laundry. And... Uh, so Sheila came. Well, the first thing our dad did was tell her she needed to get into school. So he worked it out so she could supposedly take care of us and go to school on the side or take care of us on the side. Anyway, so I was supposed to go check on Kent during my class break and Sheila would go check on him during her class break. And this is a two-year-old kid. Anyway, thanks to... So that's what happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to the neighbors, he, he made it. But anyway, it, it was no big, no small sacrifice for Kent's life. And I don't know what mom and dad were thinking in that time, but they were tr trying to do the best they knew how, I'm sure. And one day when Kent was about three, came home that evening and nobody had seen Kent all day. Nobody knew what had happened to Kent. He looked around, couldn't find Kent. Till Freddie came home from the garden and he had Kent with him. And Kent had followed Freddie up to the garden. And this was way up in the hills. It wasn't just the other side of <laughs> of, of the yard. It was a long ways, and we were so relieved when Kent got home, but I'm sure he got a scolding to not go there again without somebody knowing, and probably Freddie figured out that he better just come and take him rather than... <laughs> oh, I was Mama's boy. I never got in trouble. <laughs> but Steve, but Steve, Steve had the best school story. I, I think it's probably true that he went a whole semester, never went to class. <laughs> they never <laughs> missed him. <laughs> He'd hide out in the cocoa. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the story. <laughs> yeah, change it now. <laughs> the shoe cobbler's kids go without shoes, and the educator's kids went without education. <laughs> well, Stephen and I weren't old enough to go to secondary school at that time, so we got enrolled in the primary school at Cloget. And so every morning, Steve and, and Jeffrey and oh, myself I'm headed for Cloget, but many mornings we didn't all arrive. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody told Mom and Dad, evidently. <laughs> so I never knew how good we had it till Mom's funeral when Steve got up and started talking and said, um, how many people can say they they stoned a mango or they ate manicou. Um, just just the, the things like that we did. Um, we went to Acuff school and we didn't have anywhere to go to school. Well, we went swimming most of the mornings and then she would take a nap and we got about an hour of school. And um, But all the wandering around we did, all the getting lost and going and fishing in the rivers and all that stuff, um, that was a better education than we could have got at any school. So, 
Um, we might not have had the basics in education, but one thing it did teach us is how to how to survive. And well, I think we those... so good, but we could chop a crayfish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we knew where every ripe fig was. Yeah, <laughs> where any so, mango tree was had mangoes. And and I was a uh, honor a little spoiled to another bunch. And being the only after you guys all left as me and Quentin, and we're the only white kids in the village. So I just figured when you grew up, you became black. <laughs> it never happened, but <laughs> that's just the way we thought it was. <laughs> so that's um, that's that was one of the questions I wanted to ask was how has um, Grenada impacted our lives? We hear lots of stories about how our grand my grandparents and your parents um, affected the lives of many in Grenada, but how have has our lives as our our family and you individually how have we been in, impacted by the Grenada experience I thought it was ironic that dad's favorite thing was to educate those who had was too old to go to public education there and his children for the most part most of us was too young to go so we, it was the opposite effect. So we just stayed in class two or three years at a time. Yeah. Form so, one, I, I I think I was there two years. Well, I was in I was in every form except until form three. I was in one and two at, at least two years in each one, and and the only reason I I left then was because the teachers demanded that Daddy move me because I, I was too much of a problem in the classroom. <laughs> Well, I don't I, even remember how many years I spent in each class. I finally made it to form three before we came home. Well, I, I was how. always, I always fought up for last in the class if, if it was. If I didn't was, have to fight for it. I got it. <laughs> I made seven I Fs out of nine classes. I passed <laughs> science and I passed math. I flunked Bible. <laughs> <laughs> when I took That's GCE, <laughs> I took GCE, and the only two I didn't pass was Bible and and. Uh, English, and Mommy taught English, and Daddy taught Bible. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't trade education with any of those college boys. Though. I wouldn't either. I, I learned more. I may not be able to write the best and, and uh, have the best <clears throat> vocabulary, but I wouldn't trade my education for any one of y'all. Um, or anybody else's for that matter. Um, I learned more working with Mr. George each summer at the school, whether it was mixing concrete or hauling blocks or making blocks or, or uh, plastering walls with what was the old mason's name that, um, oh, his name slipped me now. John? John Mason. No. Xander kind of took over after, but the old man. I know what you're talking about. I can't call his name. I can't call his name now, but we, um, every summer there was a, a project at the school, and that he'd have Mr. George. Sir um, Laney George. Laney George head that up, <clears throat> and uh, he taught me how to sharpen a plane blade to when you planed a board, it'd whistle, and, um, I probably couldn't sharpen one now, but but back then I thought I thought that was pretty good. That's why I wanted to be a woodworker. I never was much at it, but um, some of those experiences mixing mixing concrete and carrying it in bucketfuls to to build that addition on the school and some of that stuff invaluable, invaluable. Well, you know when we got there. Immediately, as soon as Daddy could get anything together, he got us start, kids started whitewashing that school building from top to bottom. You know, paint wasn't an option. It was this whitewash lime stuff, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And I mean, us kids at our, I mean, we were young, little, you know, but had a paintbrush in our hand, and, and that's where you would find us was working on that school building, and we were as excited to do it, I think, as, as Daddy was for us to do it. And Think for yourself. <laughs> do you remember, <laughs> did you get in on any of the treating termites under the school? I did. You remember that? Oh, you remember stink. that, Albert? Chloridane. We didn't use chloridane. We used gasoline. 
<laughs> and I wonder still how in the world we kept from burning that place down. The first, the first, maybe later there was chloridane, but I don't remember. I remember getting under there with a, a paintbrush, and we'd find the the termite tunnels, and and paint gasoline on them. That killed the termites, <laughs> and uh, are supposed to. And how in the world it kept from burning that place down? I just remember going under the school and chasing bats. Yeah, <laughs> and we'd chase those bats till we'd knock them, kill them, and that was that was a fun thing. <laughs> the, the board's sticking down, and you'd run until you hit your head and knock yourself out. Well, Ruth mentioned the, the old Buchan was was empty. The only thing that it had in it then was spirits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear them walk from one end of the building to the yeah. other at night. You go in there at night, and you could hear them. If you were down downstairs, you would hear them walking upstairs. If you went upstairs, they'd be walking downstairs. You had to clean a room. You wanted to be sure and get it done before dark before night. Before dark. They claim it was fed on spirits. Yeah, probably was. From fed on days that they stayed there. And I don't know if it was or not, but... They had me convinced there was spirits in that building. The motivation to get your work done for that. Oh, yeah. Albert, do you have anything to say? Well, I went back as a missionary in my own right for four years, and so a lot of my memories are updated from the early years. And I tried to maintain Daddy's uh, approach to education, and and I believe that that today Nareen Augustine as the principal is attempting to carry on that same legacy to make it possible for people's lives to be changed and for them to come from maybe a background of nothing or hard times or whatever but because of an opportunity at education that they're able to succeed and, and raise their families better than what they've been raised and 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 also to help not only themselves but other people in the process and I think that's part of the legacy we share that we all care about other people and and it has made a, a difference in my own life I have to say that credit where credit is due and I don't want to down the church effect at all but it was not a church um, project nearly as much as it was a man's vision and his devotion to that vision to make it happen. And as time went on, it was not the church that really supported the school, probably much more so the, church, the school supporting the school church and that was daddy's hope that um, education would help with some of that but it, it's sad to to say that it wasn't our church kids that really benefited as much as it was the community and the Grenadians as a whole of the of daddy's efforts um, there were a few from that came, but um, how has it impacted your life? For my life, it gave me a compassion, I think, for but I, I never felt I never felt deprived and God was good to us kids and gave us abilities and talents that education couldn't give us and didn't give us, but Seeing the humanity um, part of mom and dad's life was a great thing. And the privilege of of mixing, you know, I, color wasn't a, we learned real early that color had nothing to do with um, your friendships, you know. And that was a new idea um, for in America, in the U.S. That's right. Before, because we were so segregated a lot in the 50s and 60s. So. 
when we traveled to Florida to catch the plane in Miami to go to Grenada, us children were just amazed that you'd stop at a gas station and they'd have bathrooms for the white and bathrooms for the col uh, colored black, whatever you wanted to call it. Um, we, we never thought in those realms people were people and once we got to Grenada it wouldn't have mattered I could stand next to any color and be as comfortable as if it was my own race. Um, Nate you've been pretty quiet do you have anything you want to say? He was busy running around checking out the... Anybody you want to give a shout out to? Well if you guys don't know Nareen um, I suggest you, when you go down there, get to know her a little bit. She has done, Nareen, the principal, she has done an amazing job bringing the school back from on the brink of being shut down by the government. Um, it was on the list to close. And she she's done an amazing job of bringing it back. To, um, the amount of students has almost doubled, or it has doubled since she's been a principal. Um they have a little bit of pride back in it. Five years ago, that school was, um, besides being on the brink of being shut down, it was a school that if you couldn't get in anywhere else, it was a last chance school for all the kids that didn't want that couldn't get in anywhere else. Um, and they got the bottom of the barrel the students. Um, they're back now to where they're competing for the top students um, in sports and um, every every part of it. And there's there's some pride back in the school. If you haven't got to know her, um, and I mean, I go down and just kind of hang out at the school, and I'm not involved in the church at all, but I go down and, and hang out with the school kids and um, took my family down there, Macy and them. I mean, they were besties with some of the kids, and um, just the interaction with the kids, um, it I don't think I've ever seen 250 kids all smiling at the same time like we did last time we went down there where five years ago it was everybody was long faced and didn't want to be there. The teachers didn't want to be there. Um, it was rock bottom and it has come a long, long ways. Good. I'm looking forward to meeting her <clears throat> in January. Anybody else have anything? Last thing I want to do, I want to start over here with Steve. Um, I want you to just tell us who you are and um, tell us your nickname and if you have something about how you got your nickname and then a little bit just uh, something very quick about your family, who, your spouses and children, grandchildren. I'm Steve Shaper. I was eight years old when my parents went to Grenada to start SJCSS. I attended school there. I took the GCE exams. I graduated from the school. Would have been in what? In uh, 73? I came home in January of 74. I think it was 73. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, my nickname I got from a, a boy from Guav named Carl Lewis, and I got it because I didn't go to school for a semester or so, and uh, I got the nickname of Huck. He said I was like Huckleberry Finn, and uh, so people that know me well still call me Huck to this day. I'm married to my... Uh, eighth grade sweetheart. I didn't go to high school with her, so I have to go back to eighth grade, probably when I was first smitten. We've been married in February. It'll be 50 years. We have six children. I have 19 grandchildren, 18 that I've met. I'll meet the 19th one in December, and um, two great-grandchildren. And so I've been blessed beyond my deserves, and I'm grateful that uh, I was part of 
of uh, Melvin Shaper's family and got to experience Grenada, the impact it made on my life is immeasurable. And um, I look back on it with, with fond memories. I love getting together with the family as we are now and, and tell stories of, of uh, those good old days sitting around on the, the rails and the walls and telling Tim Tims and, and uh, making cooks and um, going diving and whatever else it was, chasing girls, Lyman, just uh, we were just one of the Grenadian guys and uh, I thank God for the privilege to have been involved. And what are you? What, what is your occupation right now? I right now am, uh, I guess, officially retired. <laughs> um, I still do some yard work. I worked at our school here in Kansas for 33 years, and this year my wife and all I left the school. Um, as as workers there, we're still involved in helping and interested in the education process of our young people but otherwise i'm uh, officially retired from from uh, hourly work anyway all right i'm albert and i was nine years old when we went to grenada and i went to school there all the way through form five graduated in 71 and form six I graduated in 73 and then returned to the states and I don't know what else you want me to say nickname. You're, you're oh, married my, to Della. my nickname in Grenada was Pooks and friends and family still call me that to That's this day funny. and I think the nickname came from my grandpa who called me Bookie Boodle, and then that was shortened to Bookie. And when we went to Grenada, there was one of my friends there that couldn't understand Books. I guess it went from Bookie to Books, and then, and so he was trying to figure out what name it was, and he said Pooks, and everybody laughed, and then it stayed Pooks. And so that's been my nickname ever since. Uh, and what else? Did you already tell about your kids? I, I'm married to Della and I have three children and 12 grandchildren and three great grandchildren, one of which is in heaven now. And anyway, my life has been full and we still enjoy getting together with family and, and immediate interaction with brothers and sister. And we love that. And these opportunities to get together but we also enjoy getting together with our Grenadian friends and family and and we do that as often as we can as well you forgot to tell him you were the Pope what's that he forgot to tell him he was the Pope of the church oh. Ken's being just a little disrespectful here calling <laughs> me the Pope but he's referring to the fact that I am the general superintendent of the Bible Holiness Churches so and how many there years you have you been? I've been in that position for 12 years. <laughs> well, I'm Ruth, and I'm the lone flower among all the thorns. <laughs> but I was, I was um, 14 when we went to Grenada, and um, I am 74 now, so way up there. I don't know where, where that spot in there went to but um, it was a privilege to be in Grenada I had been there about two and a half years and I thought I got smart and wanted to come back to the states and and go to school here and so on so my father gave me the privilege of doing what I thought I wanted I could never tell him that I sure wished I hadn't done that because Grenada was a lot easier on me than <laughs> being away from my whole family. But I did, and uh, I missed my little brothers, and, and I missed my mother and daddy. But I did finish Form 3 in Grenada, and um, 
it was a privilege to be a student there at the school. I'm a retired nurse, and um, I have a husband, Gary. We've been married 54 years, and I have four children, um, and 14 grandchildren, 13 grandchildren, <laughs> no great grandkids, <laughs> and I've been really blessed. I'm Quentin. Uh, they call me Prexo in Grenada. My sister, or Betting when I first went, but after I came back to the States, my sister saw how skinny I was, and so she told me I looked like a pretzel. So my name was Pretzel. That was my nickname. But Peter, my best, one of my best friends in Grenada, he couldn't, he couldn't get that figured out, Pretzel, so he called me Prexo. So that's what stuck in Grenada. Everybody call me Pretzel, but my brothers still call me Pretzel. And uh, good friends call me Pretzel. So I guess I'll answer to most anything as long as they call me for dinner. Uh, I was five years old when I went, so I have limited memory. Not to mention the fact that we were a little scattered here and there and the... Uh, uh, wasn't that well established when we went, so my memory base bank is not as good as some of the older ones. But uh, it was a lot of good times. I remember a lot of days, a lot of hours in Basse Chateau, swimming and diving under those big stones. The ones my age and older would remember. Since then, the hurricane has thrown all of that down, and and our little swimming hole is is kind of gone uh, but a lot of great wonderful memories there with wonderful friends that many of them still remain still have contact with some not as many as i'd like and i don't remember as well as i'd like on a lot of that but it was good times uh, i'm like some of the others uh, the education part for us younger ones was a little a little bit of a struggle and and so on but i think education can be measured in a lot of different ways and my education wasn't married uh, wasn't measured in in reading and writing uh, but the things that were important value of friendship and relationships that kind of education is priceless and I wouldn't exchange my education there for anybody else's. I've made my living as an auto mechanic. Um, worked with my hands all my life. Still work with my hands. I still love farming and so on. I have, I raise cattle and uh, enjoy that a lot. It gives me fulfillment. I still build many relationships and continue to build and gain new relationships. All my relationships are important to me. My relationship with my God, my family, and my friends, all important. I feel like I learned that value from the example of my parents. <clears throat> I've been married to Pam for 45 years, I have three children, seven grandchildren and one on the way. I've been blessed beyond imagination, beyond what I could ever dream. I have no regret having grown up on the island of Grenada. In fact, I'm proud to tell people that that's where I grew up. I still love to go back once in a while. and. Uh, like I said, my childhood was different than most people's childhood, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. So, Quentin, if we can go back for a second. Um, legend has it that um, growing up, you all had so much car trouble that Grandma prayed that one of you kids would be a mechanic. So <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I became a mechanic partly because, oh, I need Marco here to tell me who the name of the guy, but 
some fella from up by Florida was was going up the hill and came past the school and he got up by Ram Dean's corner and uh, he stalled out. He couldn't go any further. I don't know how old I was, but I probably started driving when I was about 10 or something. So as a little guy, and dad would leave the keys in the in the old Volkswagen van. Well, I would, uh, sometimes it needed washing and sometimes it didn't. But either way, it would get washed because that meant I got a chance to drive it. So I was pretty proud I could drive at an early age. Well, here this person uh, broke down up there by Ram Dean's corner by Tika. And motor fell out of it. Well, that was the van. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so so I grabbed my, my dad's Volkswagen van and uh, headed up to give him a tow because he needed somebody to tow him on up the hill. And I couldn't have been more than 11 or 12. I don't know. And so we tied onto that car, and I didn't know you had to tie on certain places. Well, I tied the rope or whatever we were pulling with to the support that held the engine up on the van. So it was on a hill, so I rode the clutch and got that thing going and hit the end of that rope or chain, whatever it was we had, and it just jerked that support right out from under the engine. Well, those who know how a Volkswagen set up with the engine in the back, the engine fell down on the ground. The throttle cable remained connected. And so the engine's running wide open. And I'm terrified. Don't know what to do. Finally figured out to turn the key off. Somehow we got the old van. It wasn't an old van. It was a fairly new van. Got it back down to the house. And my... <laughs> was it <laughs> plate number 1136 pi says got it back down to the house <coughs> and my father who was no mechanic at all until the day he died no mechanic at all was so put out with me i had not asked permission i had no right uh i just assumed it was okay to take the family van of course that's what he would have done but anyway, he told me, he said, well, you broke it. You're going to have to fix it. I had no idea how to do any kind of mechanic work. I didn't have uh, Brother Bob Hazelwood to teach me mechanics. He was gone by then. But a lot of the tools were still hanging on the wall in the toolbox. And so I don't know how I figured out or who who helped me all together but there was a guy that broke all the bolts off in the motor and so I had to figure out first of all how to get those out and uh, somebody told me well there's a tool called an easy out which I got very used to in my career uh, many years as a mechanic uh, said there's a guy in in Guav that has a set of those easy outs and so I went and talked to him and asked him if I could borrow his easy outs and he let me borrow his easy outs and so I drilled those bolts and easy outed them out and figured out how to jack the motor back up and get it put into place and put the bolts back in and make the old van run so that was my first mechanic job and I guess I guess it was one of those things I could figure out I could work with my hands and figured out I could be successful at it and so that was the beginning of my mechanic career and so then in high school I, I went to work as a helper for a, a very good mechanic and learned some more and then later on opened my own business as a mechanic and uh, I guess you might say the rest is history. Um, it was a good life for me, a fellow that could barely read enough to get by but I could read enough to to learn a little bit about mechanics and I loved it and enjoyed it I retired just uh, in July this year from my job as the bus mechanic for the local school district and so it's still a part of my life I looked at a car this morning I suppose I'll always uh, do a little bit of mechanic work but for the most part I've retired from it 
Was that what you wanted? Speaking of the van, how many people could how many people could we get in there? Thirty two. Thirty two. Thirty two people in the van. Thirty two people in a Volkswagen van. Was that a few hanging between the bumper when you fell out? Well, I think there were about that many in there when I fell off the back end because it was slippery where you put your bum bum. <laughs> it was slippery. So going up past uh, Waterloo. One peg or two. <laughs> sitting on one peg of bum bum. <laughs> so <laughs> when we passed Waterloo <laughs> and Daddy Man accelerate, my foot slipped off the bumper and went between the bumper and the the engine compartment there and so my foot was dragging on the ground and my gym boots was eating out <laughs> i don't know how we got stopped but somehow somebody got the van stopped and i pulled myself back out and crawled back up in there and on up the hill we went i don't know if that's for sure the time we counted but one of those times when we were loaded like that somebody got out and started counting people as they came out and there was 32 people riding from guav to brothers on on that Volkswagen van. Oh, I don't know how many seats, but seats didn't matter. You was stacked up. You was hanging out the back. You was hanging off the edge. I I hardly ever got to ride in seats in those situations. I got to ride in the back. So you breathe the fumes, but you didn't have to walk. So I'm Kent. Um, I guess pie was my nickname because I was a sweetie pie, and still I am. Um, <laughs> for work, these guys are all retired. I still got to work for a long time. I, I don't have enough money to retire, so I got to keep working. Um, still a guav man. Guav will always be home. Um, even when I go down there, the tourists go to St. George's. I'd rather go to gun battle and drink a beer with my buddies and gun battle and all the restaurants on in guav and um that's home um like i said the tourists go to st george's so um all the all the fun stuff growing up chasing manicus with a bangonet um catching crayfish putting the chloridane in the water and stunning the crayfish and picking them up i'm not sure how i'm not dead yet um just all the craziness we did. Um, I wouldn't trade it. I still like to go back down there and still have a cold one with the guys in gun battle. That's still home and took the kids down there this year and they enjoyed it. They're ready to go back. But we've got been married to Aaron and we have four girls and I have one son and a grandbaby on the way and we have one adopted kind of adopted son james so there's six of us in the family um hopefully i'll take him down there maybe in january but um it, it was a great experience i still love going down there still going around the school um the school is near and dear to my heart um fun to take soccer balls down and watch the kids eyes light up and um, try to motivate them and tell them they can amount to something so Kids, I mean, Nate, tell us about you just old Nate how'd you get Nathan we're glad you're here about it we might have well, to I'll have to talk for Nathan then. Okay, go ahead. So this is really Nathan talking. <laughs> Live in Oshaleta. Got a whole lot of kids, a whole lot of grandkids. And I'm just Nate, grandpa to everybody. Got a lot of pocket knives. Got a lot of collect anything. Um, he still plays Santa Claus at Family Christmas. Still plays Santa Claus. He can argue about anything, whether... He's right or not, That's he's enough. always right. <laughs> but he, but he a, drove the school bus, and he was he was he wasn't a Guav man. He was a Victoria man. Did we ever figure out the name of the bus? No, I can't. But that. but he was a Victoria man, he knows, he knows. and he he'd go fishing. But um, his buddy drowned. A mud mask got the turtle using Nate's gun. His best friend was George Wilson growing up, um, and. Probably a lot of them girls still still hoping he'd be a single man coming back. 
Okay. But that was that was Nate and the, the bus driver. He probably still sending sugar and milk down. Probably still mm-hmm. sending sugar and milk down for him. Hey, we're so. going to wrap it up, guys. Uh, I was telling the story he told me the other day about diving and the blacking out on the way up. That was probably picking up mud mass. Too long ago. Picking Lunch? up long ago. You Jones. a couple weeks. Lunch is getting cold, guys.